nice to, to see you all here. Uh, today you're going to be uh, hearing from Miriam Isaacs, who is at the uh, Meyerhoff Center at the University of Maryland. And um, I'm sure that, that her reputation precedes her with the uh, reservations that we've been getting. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm going to which in Yiddish means, and it's a great pleasure to see all of you, those few of you that don't know Yiddish. Um, I was about 10 years old, taking a stroll with my father on the streets of Montreal, when he explained to me why we use Yiddish at home. I had never questioned that. To me, it seemed utterly natural. It was our own language. Yiddish, going uh, downhill, began over a, a century ago on a smaller scale. Jewish thinkers were foremost in understanding the implications of modernity, both good and bad. Included in their ranks were the first linguists and anthropologists, my inspirations academically, Franz Boas, Edward Sapir, Leonard Blumfeld. In only a few generations, Ashkenazi Jews experienced enormous shift from traditional lives centered on religion, extended family, and community to urbanization and geographic spread. Yiddish went from being predominantly a vernacular to a sophisticated language with a full range of literary functions, newspapers, and active theater. I brought some examples of newspapers, still, still going. Um, all that peaked in the, the teens and in the end of the 1920s and then began a steep decline. The number of Yid native Yiddish speakers has dropped in, those, in that century from about 11 million to a few tens of thousands. And those tens of thousands are mostly Hasidim, followers of dynastic rabbinic sects, who keep themselves separate from mainstream society as long as possible. Hasidim hold that in the exile of Egypt, Jews did not assimilate because they kept their language, their clothes, and their names. And they, try, and they themselves try and adhere to that policy by keeping reclusive even from the mainstream of Jews. There are now some 14 to 15 million Jews worldwide, over 6 million in the U.S. and over 5 million in Israel. Most of the younger generation of these Jews have never heard Yiddish spoken and have not been taught about it or why it might have been important. Those who do know feel the loss. Those who don't know, I think, are missing something important. Heinrich begins the, the textbook with Yiddish is an international Sprache. Jeden von allen Ländern reden Yiddish in Argentina, in Mexico. So Jews everywhere speak Yiddish in Argentina and Mexico. Everybody speaks Yiddish. It's not true now. It wasn't even true when he wrote the textbook. <laughs> <laughs> because it was after the war. It was in the early 50s. It was already uh, on its way out as, a, as a, a language of connection. So the big dilemma that I faced, that the Zapotecs faced, it's, it's, the, it's, it's a twofold dilemma. How do you define your community? One of the things I told the kids in the Mexican school, because they asked me why Yiddish, and I said basically what parents, the Yiddish writer, would have liked, that it forms nationhood, that it forms a sense of peoplehood, and that's an important part of the heritage that, to hold on to. And it occurred to me that when we speak a different language, it's how you define us and them. Um, and that when your own language becomes the, a them language, then you cut yourself off from prior generations in attitude as well as in comprehensibility. On the other hand, you don't want to be exclusive in the way that Hasidim are exclusive, cutting themselves off from the rest of the world. I like talking to these Zapotecs, even if it was in English or in Spanish. I, I, I'd rather communicate than not communicate. So to go back to my father's remark, which is people are perfectly capable of being multilingual. In Judaism, there is an ancient and venerable tradition of multilingualism. I read the uh, Wikipedia article this morning, and they made a very brief mention on an autonomous area in Russia <laughs> that uh, where uh, Yiddish is an official language or the official language. Yeah. Are you, uh, the good familiar? news is that it's got an official status. The bad news is that nobody lives there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, one of, it's like the Indians on the reservations, right? Where do you put them? The place where nobody else wants to buy real estate.